intention is that uh, it is pleased our Lord to come Dale Green uh, to his eternal rest. And I saw him on Friday, and, and maybe Ed saw him Saturday, I'm not sure, with the things we were And we knew that was uh, imminent, but that's as much as I know. I have to tell you this morning. I have what plans are my team. Kevin doesn't get back till the night. That's Certainly not a big surprise in uh, the situation he's in. This is certainly one who would, you know, the best is yet to come. I told him that Friday. He said, the best is yet to come. And uh, he's got the best now. Good Lord. Yeah. Very good. Their anniversary was just uh, Friday at all. Yeah, but anyway, stand by for information as it comes. From the well, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for the years of grace you bestowed upon Dale and his family. And you have now called him to your nearer presence. And for this, we give you thanks and praise. So we know it's time for the Lord soldier to rest. Be with the families that make their plans and be with all of us as we uh, prepare for uh, this uh, coronation service for the day of the day. We commend ourselves into your hands now. Lead us and guide us for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. And that, how do I say another word about this? I, I was thinking about this the other day. The, the timing is so good. We have here, of course, a uh, fair number of people have no idea who they agree with, right? Because uh, come after that, and then we have a group here who does know. Them. And I think it's worth reminding some of you folks that don't know some of these people that they all like 94 years old. But he's one of those that many people upon whose shoulders we all stand. Those who have gone before us, if it wasn't for them, it might not be a group for them. Uh, I can say about some of those who are still with us here today, too. For some of you younger folks, you know, good to reflect on that last night. As you look around on this way here, folks, remember that it's on our shoulders that we are standing. I don't mean we are replacing clubs, but humanly speaking, uh, they bestow years and years of labor in the harvest. And then the next generation reaps the benefits, and hopefully then they also prepare for the next generation. Okay. Catechism. What are we after that? The second petition, we have to do. Last time I was here was the first petition. I don't know if you did one last week. Second petition of the Lord's Prayer and the Catechism, and then we'll dismiss the children. Thy kingdom come. What does this mean? Kingdom of God certainly comes. The kingdom of God certainly comes. By itself without our prayer. By itself without our prayer. But we pray in this petition. But we pray in this petition. That it might come to us also. That it might come to us also. How does God's kingdom come? God's kingdom. <laughs> God's kingdom comes. Comes. When our Heavenly Father gives his, us His Holy Spirit. When our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit. So that by His grace. So that by His grace. We believe His Holy Word. We believe His Holy Word. And lead godly lives. And lead godly lives. Here in time and there in eternity. Here in time and there in eternity. So, children among us. Before that, okay. it doesn't matter. The announcements. Okay. And then we'll have to switch. Several. A week from tomorrow is the blood drive. So coming around with the blood drive sheet and it's for volunteers to do You can go to donorsign.org to schedule yourself an appointment with the program and the board of Group called Lutheran Ladies Lounge, and one of the ladies, wife of a pastor.
chapter, asked if anybody had um, a 1986 version Concordia self-study Bible that they're not using. This one is a visual aid I stole from Rick Raver. He's using it. Um, if you have one at home, because you've got me with this good in all room Concordia study Bible. It's a mission church he's serving, and they need some for a Bible study. So if you have any of these, hang around. Let me know. Other messages, did you have one? Speaking of working in the harvest, um, I just want to give you an update oh, okay. on the work of the principal call committee. Um, the call committee has been working now for at least what, three months, two, three months now. Uh, we went through what I'm called what I'm calling round one of pr possible principal candidates. We had 14 names, and we had no success with those 14 names. Um, we interviewed two. Uh, one was not qualified. The other withdrew his name when we asked him to come for a second interview. So that four, group of 14 names, we're done with that. We are now digging into the national um, LCMS uh, database looking for principal candidates. Uh, we, we already went through one really good candidate late this week. Um, he is not available for a call. We have two names out right now to the call committee for consideration. Um, I'm assuming we're going to contact these two people uh, to see if they are willing to do an interview for a call. Um, after that, uh, we have several more names already lined up, but these two don't, don't play out for us. So the work continues, and what I'm asking all of you to do is please pray fervently that God will prepare the right person to come and serve as our principal at Bethlehem Lutheran School, and that we will be prepared, that we will find that person and help prepare them to bring them here. So. This is something I ask you to pray fervently for every day. We really need this. Um, our school right now, I think this is the best year ever at Bethlehem Lutheran School with the principal and teachers that we have. It's going to change. It's very possibly going to change very significantly for next year staffing-wise. And we need, really, really need your prayers um, for God to continue his work in our school here. So please pray. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to share with everyone that the LCMS is doing a life grant match. So it's called the Million Dollar Life Grant. Uh, Nationals is going to match uh, funding that churches put in to do beginning of life ministry or adoption ministry. So if you have any ideas on anything that we can do as either a congregation or as a Lutherans for Life chapter uh, that we have here in Dayton, uh, please let me know if you have any good ideas or anything that you think uh, the chapter should do or if you want to help out, please let me know. There's little flyers with information uh, on the Lutherans for Life board there if you want to grab one. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, again, thank you for all that showed up to the town hall last week. We had a lot of good feedback, a lot of good questions. The real board meeting is going to be on the 27th at 4 o'clock. We'll get prepared for that. We have a PPC meeting tomorrow night. Please let me know if that messes your Valentine's Day up. Uh, we can reschedule it until next week if possible. If that doesn't mess with That's all for the PPC.
of 579, and then you sing one verse of five. It's very difficult to do that in the worship service. I think we, I did that once many, many years ago. You've got to do it once in a while. I mean, it takes a lot of time. Well, this one goes up. Oh, they're on bank. Yeah, you're right. Oh, he's in the back. Okay, that's what I'm Yeah, they roll it in general like that to make sure that we know it. But uh, it, so the first one is uh, 579 is about the law. And it teaches so beautifully what the law of God is about. And then, of course, 580 is about the gospel. But even more than that, then also the the key, sig the, uh, key signature, if that's the right term, is critical. Why? When you're singing the law portion, it's a minor key. And when you sing the gospel, it's a major key. And so the mood, even, is created by the, by the music itself. And so <clears throat> it goes, blah, 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 what is good and wise. And such as will be for our lives shows us a way of righteousness and news to death when we transgress. The gospel shows the Father's grace who sent his son to say our praise. I don't, I'm not going to, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but this is just such a magnificent work in every way. I, if you want to know the difference between law and the gospel, just read this hymn. This is as clear a summary as you're going to get. Yeah. But the, it shows our right, to, it shows the way of righteousness and dooms to death when we transgress. And so you've got the three uses of the law that are in the law section there. You know, uh, near, guide, curve. Uh, they're, they're all there. And then, of course, in the gospel, all that Christ has done for us. So when you sing that today, you might keep that in mind by the end of the service. You've kind of forgotten already the first hand, you know. But uh, that's, uh, take that home with you. You know, study it. You don't have a hymn or a ball, and that will uh, give you a great refresher course in the distinction of law and gospel. And then I want to do one other short thing, and then I'll get to the main part of what I'm going to do this morning. You know, two weeks ago, we talked about conscience and uh, the office of the keys, and how these two things are very closely connected. But the office of the keys is critical in keeping a clear and confident uh, conscience within us. In other words, when the law does its work of making us keenly aware of sin, of sins that it makes us conscious of, the conscience witnesses, testifies to that. And when we confess our sins and we hear and we see the good news and the forgiveness. Well, I want to uh, make sure and clarify this, that the office of the keys belongs to whom? The church, the priesthood, not just the, the pastor who's called, but to the whole church. And so we all have the responsibility to exercise the office of the keys. And there's two places where Paul makes that plain. In Ephesians and Colossians, are, these are kind of there's parallel passages. They're in a similar context in chapter 4 of Ephesians. Um, won't we'll read this whole section, just a couple of verses, 431 and following. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. <coughs> and then in Colossians, virtually identical, bearing with one another. And one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So, it is, 
What is assumed here? That the people in the church are just not all that sinful. Doesn't it? It talks about complaints, bitterness, wrath, anger. And it's in, and so uh, the church, we need to be conscious of the fact that we are at the same time sinner and saint. Now he says, forgive one another. Now, does he mean like I should walk around this morning and just kind of silently look at you? No. <laughs> What's assumed? That somebody has asked for it. And then it is given. This is critical to our home life. You're a priest. Well, priests in our home, right? Husbands absolving wives, wives absolving husbands. How about letting the children absolve you? Parents. Do you ever make mistakes? You ever run up to them and say, Will you forgive me my sins? What a powerful tool. And likewise, parents are giving absolute to my children. So the office of the kings and my conscience, our daily life, these things are critical for just everyday living as Christians. It's not just a Sunday morning and the office of the keys and the public proclamation. It's, it's necessary to our life because we do sin against each other. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespasses against us, which assumes that's what I'm doing. Any questions or comments on that? We'll go over to Galatians. Certainly not going to be able to do this epistle in any kind of great detail in the, uh, two more Sundays. I guess I have. But I wanted to uh, hit some uh, highlights of this epistle to the Galatians. It's always been our favorite. I think we did it about 18 years ago. Something like that. Anyway, looking at the first chapter in the Epistle to the Galatians, Paul is concerned about two things here, two items. One, to defend his office as an apostle and defend his message as an apostle. Those are the two things. So it starts out, uh, an apostle. And so he defends his apostleship. And then go over to verse 11. I would have you to know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached was not man's gospel. Notice the parallel between chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 1, and verse 11. An apostle, not from man. A gospel, not man's gospel. So Paul is, these two things have to be crystal clear in the minds of his audience. Why? If he doesn't have a true apostleship, his gospel is in question. And his true apostleship is what gives authority to his gospel. Right? So these two things cannot be negotiated or uh, split apart. They must go together. Paul and the apostle, not through men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, when you hear the words not from men, what's the first thing? I'm curious. What comes to your mind immediately? What's your first thought? <coughs> no, not from men. Not a Pharisee. Not a human author. Okay, you got another human office. Uh, right back to you. Okay, now, what about Timothy? His authority is derived from men. What men? The apostles. I really believe that that's what he's referring to here. Because he argues in other things. I'm not a second class apostle. He's not the next generation that came after who were appointed by the church, which is a legitimate office and appointment. 
not from him, not like Timothy, not like Barnabas. Those are legitimate ministries, but the apostolic ministry is absolutely unique. Why? Through Jesus Christ and God the Father. And notice, I, I love Paul's relevant clauses because they're absolutely critical. Not just any God who raised him from the dead. You know, when someone says they believe in God, you say, which one? Who raised Christ from the dead? Paul's just almost a little aside in this discussion. But notice his relative clauses, modifiers to the main subject. They're critical. Which Jesus, the one who was crucified, who gave himself, the next verse, right? Grace and peace to you from God, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Which one? Who gave himself? There's lots of Jesus in this day. I don't know how many names. Someone says they believe in Jesus. Which one? Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age? Now back to the apostleship there. Acts chapter 9, right? There's no question Paul did not derive his office from Peter, James, or John. That's absolutely clear in Scripture, isn't it? That he derived it from this encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. You're all familiar with the story. He's the Pharisee coming to persecute the church, and the Lord strikes him to the ground and says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Go back there to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 4. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, and you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So already, there's not just the call, but what else? A commission. I got something for you to do. And then if you go down to verse 15, go. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul derives his apostleship, his, both his call and his commission <coughs> directly. From the Lord Jesus, not from Peter, not from James and John, and his official voice as he goes out of his way to make sure we know it's not from Peter, James, and John. That's why I think that when he says not from men, he means I'm not a second class apostle. They're not a rank above me. And so my message is not a rank below me. You can't, you have to have both in this. So, back over to uh, Galatians. And then 6 through 9. Somebody read 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. So how serious is Paul about this message of the gospel? We don't go around today with usually a person or somebody. But uh, Paul did it. A cursed anybody who perverts this message of his, which is associated with his office, his direct contact, his direct call, his direct commission with Christ, anybody who changes this message is accursed. 
But the difficulty is what? We we are hearing we're hearing messages constantly of all kinds. Yeah, this was part of the sermon this morning, wasn't it? Adam. Depending on which translation you read through, some translate it as yeah, it's not a curse, but eternally condemned. Well that's the meaning. Or anathema. That's the meaning. Or anathema. I think some translations say anathema. I think that's that's kind of the bottom line. Eternally condemned. That would be a nice translation. I don't Basically know. maybe some Bibles do that. Condemned to hell. This is lethally serious. Yeah, it is. Why? Because believing the false gospel is legal. And so he has to do this. There's an eternity at stake. There's eternity at stake. So he has to do this. Is there so, a that says, do not change any dot or tittle? I'm sorry. Isn't it in Revelations that says, do not change any dot or tittle? If anyone dot changes any word in this, words of this book, yeah. Look it up. I think it's at the end, isn't it? The very end. They're, they're cursed. If you change any word of this book, I think he's referring to the book of Revelation, but we apply that to all the scriptures as well. Questions or comments? I mean, as they're not doing minute details here, uh, want to get the, uh, what I think is the heart of this first chapter his apostleship and his gospel, and how closely those are put together. So, is it correct to say that the apostles kind of jumped the gun to choosing a replacement for Judas because that already had that plan in place? Well, I wish we had a good answer for that. It certainly has been debated, but I don't Because he was that. chosen by men, right? Yep, he sure was. And Paul argues that you know he wasn't. You know, Take the time. Right, and I think it's, it's what we often do is all of us. We think we have to fill in the gap of this, but some of us got to engage in a way that we will. And I think they kind of felt like they needed to do something so that that's what they did, but God already had a plan in place for Paul. Yeah, I've heard people say, yeah, they made a big mistake there. I don't think we've got clear, there's no clear word to say that they made a mistake. We don't know a whole lot about it, obviously. But we do know Paul, who's certainly one untimely born, as we heard this morning in his epistle, that he is not a second-class apostle. This was constant question that was being nagging him. Why? Because he wasn't there in Galilee in the same way that they were walking in the footsteps of Jesus in Jesus' little seminary. But didn't he have personal catechism for three years somewhere? No, we haven't got to that yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Um, his apostleship is from the Father to the Son by the Holy Spirit and just so his gospel I would have you know brothers that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel I did not receive it from any man and a little while later he goes out of his way to say I didn't, I didn't have any contact with those apostles until later I didn't get this from that. I got it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now again, we can't prove this definitively from Scripture, but if you go back to the book of Acts, and we don't necessarily know that Paul wasn't around Christ. I mean, he could have been. It's very possible he was one of the Pharisees following Jesus around everywhere trying to discredit him. It's possible, yeah. Certainly. Yeah, he, it'd be hard to imagine that he didn't have some contact with Jesus during his life. But now we're talking about after his conversion. And then you look at the time sequences here. You know, that he comes uh, when he's first in the, in the book of Acts, when he's first converted, right away he's arguing with everybody, right? Because he's got this all this zeal. But what happens? They send him away. And he kind of disappears for a while. 
And then he comes back to the church, and then he is sent out, you know, by the church on Barnabas to do their missionary journey. So what happened during that time? And again, uh, we can't prove this definitively. I'm certainly inclined to think that he spent three years with Jesus. And uh, some, you know, how that was, Jesus appeared to him, taught him everything he needed to learn. Because he says, through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Not by contact with the, those who went before me, but with contact with Jesus Christ. Even prior history, I can imagine that he would be an apostle proved by him. Because he very much like that. <coughs> right. Yeah. There were, there, he, they were afraid of him, and there was a tension there for a while, which was finally resolved. Uh, I'm just saying, they, couldn't, they couldn't possibly yeah. say, yeah, yeah, let's take him. So, oh, at that point, yeah. 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 Was there a replacement? Yeah. Yeah. So he couldn't possibly be appointed by him. He had to do something Well, he makes that plain, doesn't he? So he's not only called and commissioned directly by Christ, he receives his gospel directly from Christ, not from Peter, James, and John, and the others. There's an interesting little thing here in verse 15. When he who had set me apart before I was born, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, though I preach him to the Gentiles, did not immediately consult with anyone. In fact, that before I was born, Jeremiah and Isaiah, we get almost exactly the same words uh, from Jeremiah and Isaiah. They talk about, before I was born, you formed me in my womb. You called me even when I was in my mother's womb. Just a, uh, a, a little tidbit that's funny. You know, that here's Paul, you know, before he was even born, the Lord had his hand on him. Yes, he first came to the church, and he was a Pharisee, a teacher of the people of Israel, but the Lord already had his hand on him, just like he did And I think we could say that about all of us who are baptized in Christ Jesus. That he had his hand on us about even before we were born even before that holy baptism, uh, had his thumb on you and became the holy baptism adopted in his family. Did you? It, it is, you, this is true, and it's really unique because God chose Paul before he was born. And it says, for the Gentiles, right. the rest of the apostles kind of wandered around thinking whether it was whether they should go to the Gentiles or just stay with the children of Israel. But God said, I got a guy that I want. Him. And his whole life was preparing him for that. And we do not know if any of the other apostles were Roman citizens. In that time, that was a unique, very special thing to be. He made well, being a Jew, also being a Roman citizen, really put him in a unique position. Yeah, got him killed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he got to, no, he used no. that, but you're yeah. right. Yeah, the I mean, this, is, this is the way God uses interesting things. He moved him around the empire and got him in the space. <laughs> think of Peter standing in front of him. Well, I'm a Roman citizen. I, I, I get a trial in Rome. Uh, yeah. yeah. I get a trial, all right. Take him out and whack his head <laughs> But Paul, oh, they got to do it. The Lord knows what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, the right person, the right job. Yeah. He didn't consult with anyone. Went away into Arabia and returned to the, again to Damascus. So, again, they trying to piece together the chronology of things in the book of Acts and here, you know, there's different kind of ways to put it together. But something happened. He went away for a while. And I, I, I says, again, I says, he was getting in trouble, arguing, being, 
these people. And just my own little imagination says, the Lord says, I need to get him out of here and get him better trained because he might get killed too soon. <laughs> yeah. And so he takes him out and, and does his three years of seminary training with him and uh, sends him back into the valley after that. church, right? So eventually he does go up to Jerusalem. So now uh, we have the uh, apostolic ministry this, you know, the apostles that were with Jesus originally are going to give the right hand of fellowship to Paul and acknowledge that he's not a second class apostle. That he has been commissioned uniquely to the Gentiles. Even though Peter broke that house too, right? Peter got called to go to talk to the Gentiles, and we have that whole situation, which worked together for Paul's good, that Peter had that experience. How so? Peter came to Paul's defense. Right? Peter, Paul was being attacked. This guy is been, you know, out there preaching this gospel to his unclean people, you know, and Peter, Peter says, wait a minute. I did that. <laughs> the Holy Spirit sent me to the Gentiles, and I didn't want anything to do with it, but it was the Lord's doing. So how can we deny that the gospel is going to the Gentiles? The Lord sent me there. And now we have this man, Paul, and he also going to the Gentiles. And he makes it goes out of his way here, after three years up to Jerusalem, to visit Cephas, remained with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And James was a very popular figure in the church in Jerusalem. Uh, where the others were, uh, who knows, but for some reason his contact was limited. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They have only heard it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Now, something you have to do here is forget the chapter mark, because it's obvious that chapter 2, the first few verses, are a continuation of what he's saying. Right? And again, I want you to just look at this whole chapter and see the two things. His apostleship and his message. Everything about him totally authentic. He got his apostleship, his call, his commission directly from Christ, not from the other apostles. And he got his message directly from Christ, not from the other apostles. And so uh, these people who are troubling the Galatians and telling them Paul is not, uh, you know, he's not a, a number one class apostle. Uh, we've got a different message and in fact they might have argued we've got the message that James gave us you know, and a different understanding of the law and this guy Paul is perverting this understanding of this distinction between the law and the gospel and then that's what Galatians is finding out about this proper distinction between the law and the gospel and it's possible that they were you know, saying their message came from the apostles up there where Paul, we don't know where he came from, and arguing it in that way. And after 14 years, he went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Why was that important? Barnabas helped give him the key. Right? He says, hey, this man needs to be faithful to preach the gospel. You need to acknowledge that. And he took Titus along with him, went up because of the revelation, and set before them though privately, before those who seem influential, set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not right or had not been in vain. Paul oh, likes that word vain. Did you notice that? In the epistle lesson, okay? You know, empty. Empty. Purposelessness. No purpose. 
That's what happens. If his apostleship is not from Christ, if his gospel is not from Christ, it is vain and empty. If there's no resurrection, he said, then our message is vain and empty. I'm a liar. Call me a liar. Because he preaches the resurrection of the dead. So that's what I wanted you to uh, look at today. This first chapter, like I said, I, my intention is to hit some highlights uh, and going forward from this epistle to the Galatians. Questions or comments? Does I really have nothing else to say? <laughs> I'm retired. I can do that. <laughs> so we can visit for 15 minutes. Unless you guys have something you want to discuss here in this regard. Go home and think about this. Read through this first chapter and look at how critical the apostleship and his message hangs together and that it does come directly from Christ. By the way, if the office of ministry today comes from me, in the best sense of the word, just as Titus and Timothy, Barnabas, Ignatius, Polycarp, I really think that's what Paul means when he says, not for me, because of what he says about James and what he does later. Right? They didn't do it in Christ. The office today comes from Christ, but through the church in the immediate, not immediate sense. Let us pray. Your Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for uh, this very clear message, powerful message. The, the gospel that we cannot change in any way, shape, or form, that we do not want to add to or take away from in any way, shape, or form, but to firmly believe that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ handed to us from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the apostolic word and through the scriptures that we have from the apostles. We commit ourselves into your hands, lead us and guide us for your name's sake. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, he's in prison. Oh, Tim is back. Where, 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 no, he left. He left. He left. I, maybe he was back last week. I didn't see him. But Tim McKenzie is back in his employment. Thanks for the doctor. And then last week, Austin departed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.